Welcome to another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. I am Dr. Bill Kanaski, and this is a very, very uh, special episode and, and, and dear to my heart. And the second go around uh, on this, and this is something I want to stay on top of uh, for me personally, uh, my audience, and, and anybody else that listens uh, to this podcast, um, it's just a topic that's dear to my heart. Uh, most of you know, um, I am a JFK assassination uh, junkie. Um, I have followed it for a long time. I've I've read almost everything. And, um, you know, what I saw this week in America, I, I saw I saw a hot air balloon from China go across this country. And I saw incredible emotional reactions. People have lost their minds over <laughs> this, over a hot air balloon. And on November 22nd, 1963, the president of the United States was murdered in broad daylight, okay? Got his head blown off, okay? And to this day, nearly 60 years later, we can't get the documents from our government about this incredible crime of the century, crime of you name it. Um, absolutely, absolutely uh, incredible. And a lot of work is being done to get those documents and to get some answers, because I believe uh, we all deserve those answers. The American people deserve those answers. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, this is a legal podcast uh, and there's a lot of legal issues um, around these documents. And uh, my two my two guests today uh, are, are just phenomenal. Um, uh, Jefferson Morley, uh, JFK researcher and author. Uh, Jeff, I got I got your I got your book right here. <laughs> my book right here. The the latest, the Scorpion Dance, the President, the Spy Master, and Watergate, and still in the middle of this, um, and, and, and get to that as, as as much as I can. And then your book before this uh, is actually my favorite, uh, the Win Scott story, um, uh -huh. Our Man in Mexico, which I think a lot of that may come up in this conversation today. Yes, it will. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, and and Larry, Larry Schnaff. Uh, Larry is an attorney, uh, an environmental attorney, but as um, uh, hooked up with Jeff, and I, I kind of want to start there. Is um, Larry and Jeff? How and either of you could take the lead. How, how did you two uh, hook up? And then we'll talk about the lawsuit. How did you two get together um, and combine your brains to 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 get the you know, the motivation, the desire to get these uh, JFK uh, documents released? Well, why don't you go first? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it originated after last year's release when, you know, the, the government went through a sham yeah. disclosure and didn't disclose much. And we started thinking about we got to do something more than just expect government agencies to obey the law. So I'm the vice president of the Mary Farrell Foundation. The Mary Farrell Foundation sponsors MaryFarrell.org, the largest online archive of JFK assassination records. Uh, and I was talking with Rex Bradford, the guy who created the site, and he was like, you know, what can we do? And our our friend Bill Simpich, who's an attorney, was like, well, let's sue somebody. <laughs> and Rex and I are not lawyers, and we're like, who are we going to sue? You know, we'd kind of been around this a few times before, and we were like, we were kind of stumped. And no, Bill was serious. Bill wanted, and so I think at that point, Bill and Larry connected, and I think Larry can take it from there. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, this actually is all about classi classified records. And um, um, I got involved through, um, I mean, I, I've been in, interested in the assassination since, I mean, he, I was 10 when the president was killed. Oh, um, we thought that he was coming into my home. We thought the assassin was going to be in our hometown of New Jersey um, when we got back from school. So we went down to the creek with our Boy Scout knives and we were going to um, <laughs> capture him. <laughs> uh, and we were um, so disappointed when it got dark and there was no assassin walking through our creek. Um, but so I've always been interested in the assassination. And then um, I, I met Bill um, around 2013 when I joined um, what was then with the Kappa, which is a nonprofit group that, um, you know, is interested, um, does research in the Kennedy assassination and Bill and I immediately hit it off, and we 
organized a mock trial um, at the South Texas College of Law for 2017. We spent literally a year um, working with our team, which consisted of Cyril Wecht and Bob Tannenbaum, who had been the um, a former counsel to the House Select Assassinations Committee for a brief period of time. So we had this uh, two-day mock trial. We got a hung jury. Um, now, that's not unusual. There's been six mock trials that have been held either by colleges or um, law bar associations since 1967. Six of the seven mock trials have resulted in an acquittal or a hung jury of Lee Oswald. Um, the one that resulted in a conviction was the famous TV trial with uh, Vince Bulagosi and yeah. Jerry Spence, which, you know, I could talk a whole <laughs> program on the mystery <laughs> Jerry Spence did, but we won't. Go um, and then after Bill and I had that, uh, got that hung jury, we decided to use um, explore a unique procedure in Texas called a court of inquiry, which is used to um, try, it's like an early version of an innocence project. And so in Texas, uh, you can try to uh, get a conviction exonerated or uh, expunged um, for, through this court of inquiry proceeding. We actually started the process and then COVID came. Oh. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, while this is going on, uh, under the JFK Records Act, the records that had not been released um, by the Assassination Records Review Board in the 90s were supposed to be released by October 24th, 2017. Um, when right before that deadline reached, uh, President Trump said he was going to release the records and then didn't. Um, and then he had a six month temporary postponement. And then in April of 2018, he then decided to have a three and a half year postponement. Now, nobody in the research community did anything about that. And Bill and I, uh, when 2021 rolled around in April of, uh, in the beginning of 2021, I organized a bunch of lawyers because uh, the, the records, President Biden was gonna have a decision uh, according to the Trump order by um, October of 2021, whether to release the records or not. So we were, I decided we were not going to let this happen. Um, the same thing happened with Trump, happened with Biden. At least we weren't gonna be passive about it. So I organized a bunch of lawyers um, in January of 2021. And we spent the, virtually the first 10 months of the year um, actually, the first nine months of the year, researching the JFK Records Act and coming up with ideas um, about how to enforce the act. What we did in that process was we also um, contacted this obscure Washington agency known as the Public uh, Interest Declassification Board, which advises the president on uh, classification issues. We had had them hold a hearing, a uh, public hearing on these on the the issue. Um, I drafted a letter to Marilyn Maloney asking her to hold an oversight hearing on the failure of the, we, we felt that President Trump did not comply with the law when he postponed the records. And we wanted to make sure that President Biden did. So we sent a letter to Carolyn Maloney, got no response. Mm -hmm. Then we, I got together a bunch of um, historians, lawyers, uh, good open government types, and we sent a letter to President Biden. Um, still no reaction uh, response. And then, of course, President Biden issues his um, memo in, in October of 2021 using the pandemic um, as grounds for postponing the records further. Wow. So at that point, um, the next thing I did was I filed a lawsuit uh, under the Freedom of Information Act to get the underlying documentation from uh, both to, from the, for the true two Trump orders to find out what really went on behind the scenes. And the government immediately settled my case at the first conference in February of 2022. And they began monthly document dumps. And what I learned from the, and it, they're ongoing still. Uh, what I learned from these document dumps was that the National Archives actually disagreed with the grounds for postponement that the CIA and the FBI were using 
uh, when Trump when Trump had to um, um, you know was going through the process of deciding whether to postpone the records or not. Unfortunately, um, the National Archives was forced to fall on its sword, and even though it objected to the grounds that the CIA and FBI were using, the archivists were basically put in a position of signing a letter that was prepared by the National Security Council, and it went through 13 versions, wow. uh, asking, recommending to the president, both in uh, September of 2017 and March of 2018, to postpone the records. So that was in interesting information that the National Archives was actually disagreeing with the grounds. And they're actually, um, they've been really, I mean, in every case, they have tried to get the records released, um, but the agencies have been you know, pushing back. So then I, say, <clears throat> I should say right there that that Bill, that was when Larry gave me first told me about that um, finding, that was a, 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 a big factor for me in going to Rex Bradford and saying, you know, let's do something. Rex is a techie. He's a tech genius. He, he's not he doesn't like the media. He doesn't like, you know, calling attention to himself. And so you know, and it's a very small foundation. He wants to stick to his knitting. Let's get JFK records online and searchable. But I went to Rex and I said, look, you know, this is a real issue inside the bureaucracy. We have allies here. You know, we're, we don't have no standing because we can see what the archives is doing. And so that was a factor in saying, hey, we've, we, we can get traction on this legally. Yeah. And let me ask you a question, Jeff, just for our audience. And, um, you know, it's funny because we have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, trial attorneys, uh, uh, you, you know, that, that listen and watch this podcast. And um, many of them are many of them are younger uh, or, or, or middle aged. And so, um, you know, their perspective on this isn't quite the same as mine or, or particularly yours. I'm not calling you old. I'm not calling you both old. No, we I'm calling <laughs> I'm calling you wise. But right. uh, Jeff, can you kind of define and Larry, you can chime in as well. Uh, what the 1992 JFK Records Act is and kind of where that came from, uh, particularly I know that you're uh, uh, friends with Oliver Stone and the the public pressure that was around when that movie came out and how that actually, I mean, this thing went to Congress and is now a law, kind of how, what, like, what was the birth of that uh, act? Well, it, so the JFK Records Act was really the byproduct of Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. And Stone had gotten interested in the assassination and he, he, he latched onto Jim Garrison as his prototype. And mm -hmm. he kind of mythologized the assassination story, but told a very different story, right? The president hadn't been killed by one man alone. He'd been killed by enemies in his own government. And Stone constructs his whole story based very closely on the historical record, but also taking some liberties, combining historical characters, that sort of thing. It's not a documentary. It's yeah. a very powerful film with a lot of A-list talent on it. And when that movie came out, it was a huge hit. Um, you know, uh, the belief that President Kennedy had been killed by his enemies had been strong from day one, despite the government's official story, the circumstances of the crime, the, the president's killed and then the assassin is killed, you know. And so, but the issue had been totally dormant. And so uh, the mainstream media was dismissive of anybody who had any different opinion. Well, here comes Stone, and not only does he make a movie, but he's got himself a monster box office hit on his hand. That's a movie that grossed a couple hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. You can still see it on rotation in cable TV. So, oh, yeah. And it was a critical hit. It did well at the Oscars and all that. Well, this story that, 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 that Stone put out there, and especially the popularity of it, this was a real snub, a rebuke to the mainstream media stone's rubbing it in their face you know yeah. most people don't believe you you know a lot of us don't believe you so anyway at the end of the movie people pointed their finger at stone and said you're a bad boy you're un american <laughs> that. and you know and stone after making some incendiary unnecessary remarks retreated to a much more plausible position which is there's a mythology of the lone gunman and this is a counter myth okay and and he said if the government isn't hiding anything, why are they hiding so much? And Stone pointed out in a little trailer at the end of the film that 95% of the records of the assassination that were held by the government were still entirely secret 30 years later. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Well, that little that little trailer set mm-hmm. off a deluge of mail and phone calls to Capitol Hill, and Congress was shamed into doing the right thing, you know, because uh, Stone had scored big time. There was no defending that, right? People, yeah. And so Congress got together and they actually wrote a good law, the JFK Records Act, which said, we're going to make all of our records public. We're not going to reinvestigate the assassination. We're going to make all of our records public and people can say the government's not hiding anything. And they and 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 they made a very important decision. They said, they took the final decision about declassification out of the hands of the individual agencies. And this goes back to Larry's point. This is all about the declassification of government records, which is its connection to our news today. So they write this law and they give the power of declassification to an independent civilian review board appointed by the president on recommendations from the American Bar Association, the American Library Association, the American Historical Association, independent people with standing. They'll review all of the records. The agencies can have some delay releasing some records for a little while, um, but we're gonna get this. And so in the 1990s, this Assassination Records Review Board, AARRB, did a great job. They declassified 4 million pages of government records that had been secret and put them in the National Archives. And then we began to get a new history of the assassination. And we began to understand what the assassination looked like from the inside of the government. We got lots of details about the so-called lone gunman, about the president's autopsy. You know, really we got the record of the JFK's assassination for the first time. So that law had a sunset provision in it. The government government agencies can withhold things for privacy, national security, names of agents, legitimate concerns, but they have to make everything public after 25 years. And the law says, except in the rarest of cases. Well, when this <laughs> rolls around with Trump in 2017, Trump caves into the CIA and FBI, gives them everything they wanted. 15,000 documents continue to contain redactions. Okay, this is four years after Congress has passed a law yeah. unanimously, right? I mean, the law couldn't be clear. The intent of Congress couldn't be clear. And the, the CIA and the FBI just, they roll the president and they get exactly what they want. Four years later, they do the same thing to Trump. They roll him, you know, and then they say COVID. The Washington <laughs> Post, came out. they said, Jeff, what's this? How come they couldn't release government records because of COVID? I said, that, that's the COVID dog ate my homework excuse. <laughs> that is pathetic. <laughs> They've had 29 years to do this, and now they're talking about COVID. There was no to- COVID 29 years ago. And so that's the situation we were in. Well, when Larry and Bill came to us with, and they said, look, we got to do something, we were already in- inclined. We were saying we got to do something. We find out the archives has been resisting the agencies on these things. We've got a good hand to play. And so that's when we said, somehow we have to enforce this law. You know, the law is a good yeah. thing. We're yeah. not fighting the law on this. The law is on our side. Yes, you know, it is. The law is against the government. So how do you get how do you get a law to be enforced against the will of you know the White House and the CIA? That's a tough challenge. But that's what we set ourselves out to do. Was we think we can use the law as a lever to get some accountability and to get the government to actually do something like the law says it should. <laughs> so let me um uh, before the act let me. For the, since the listeners are going are trial lawyers, I think they may enjoy this. Um, it turns out that the Warren Commission was Ill- illegally classified their records. It turns out that when President Johnson created the Warren Commission, um, he did not name in the executive order, did not authorize the Warren Commission to be one of the part one of the agencies that could um author uh classify documents under the existing executive order that had been in force um president uh eisenhower um had issued an order um spelling out which agencies had the original uh, classification authority and um the way this came out was uh the general uh the general counsel of the warren commission lee raskin um Rakin, um ordered the court um, reporting agency 
to mark the transcripts of the Warren Commission executive, executive meetings as uh, classified. They also classified all of their um, interviews, uh, depositions they took um, of witnesses and notes of everything. <clears throat> it turns out, and, and people didn't really realize this, that this was not, that the Warren Commission didn't have any authority until Bella Abzug held this obscure hearing um, in November of 1975. And this was kind of hidden, or it wasn't, didn't get a lot of attention because the church committee uh, was going on at the same time, right? Yeah. But she even got David Bellin, who was one of the staff attorneys and later became the executive director of the Rockefeller Commission, who, by the way, President Ford gave the authority to classify records and President Ford had been on the Warren Commission. So we, we realized the mistake that President Johnson had made. <clears throat> David Bellin actually admitted that not only did the Warren Commission um, not have any authority to classify the records, but the lawyers, David Bellin being one of them, were not read in to actually review classified records. <laughs> no. um, and then the House Select Assassinations Committee does its investigation. And under the House rules, it classifies its records for 30 years. So they would not have been available until 2029. So that's the situation uh, that we were facing when the Oliver Stone movie came out. And what the JFK Records Act did was it's a very powerful statute. It basically first provides that there's a, a presumption of disclosure. Um, it says in section 11 that it over it 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 overrules uh, any existing uh, statutory law except for the tax law. And what the agencies are supposed to do um, okay. is that they are on a document by document basis uh, they, if they are seeking to um, postpone a record, they have no. to show that there is an identifiable harm and that this identifiable harm is of such consequence that it outweighs the public interest in, in these documents. And it's on the clear and convincing evidence standard, which your listeners will know is a very high standard. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what we learned, um, President Trump, when he made his two executive orders, just made a sweeping assertion that the 15,000 documents present identifiable harm and didn't do the document by document um, uh, determination that's required by the law. So, um, and President Biden did the same thing on both Wait, of the Larry, let me ask you a question about that. Cause this is, I mean, so now we have two presidents, right? Essentially that don't agree on anything. I mean, anything except this. <laughs> and Trump came out, I'm releasing these, right? I mean, he was bound and determined. And then for a guy that never, ever, ever does a complete 180 on anything, does a pretty swift 180. And then I sent, um, I sent Jeff the, uh, the TikTok video of Judge Napolitano, <laughs> who is, uh, he has a podcast and he's been on Fox uh, News. I'll say what you want about him. But essentially, Judge Napolitano says, yeah, I talked to Trump. He's my buddy. And I told him, like, hey, you promised the release of these records. And Trump told him, allegedly, to Judge Napolitano, if you saw what I saw, you wouldn't release them either. Now, <laughs> so this we have this public interest versus national security debate, right? That's really the one of the, 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 the crux of these things. And Jeff and I, when we talked on our previous podcast, yeah, yeah, there may be some um, embarrassing things in these records, maybe for the FBI or the or the CIA. But but Jeff, isn't it true that, I mean, haven't other things come out about the CIA that's highly embarrassing as far as, I mean, they were doing experiments with LSD, right? Illegally with, with, with people. Yeah. They, they, they hooked up. I mean, it's very obvious now that the CIA and the mob were working together to 
to knock out Castro and that epically failed. I mean, there are other things that have come out on this that are highly embarrassing to the CIA. I mean, how bad can this really be? Well, there's a couple of things that work. I mean, one is we can tell from the context of the redacted material, a lot of this is is, is quite trivial. You know, yeah. one of the things that was declassified in 2021 that had not been known before and was suddenly released was the fact that the CIA had a station in Stockholm, Sweden. That's what they've been hiding for 50 years. Huge. That's a huge uh, update on this case, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, yeah. by the way, and, and so, also, here, here's the other, and the other thing that they, they um, only released in 2021 that we had a listening station in Australia. Now, here's the stupidity of the situation. <laughs> so the reason we had not released that was because the Australian government back in the 60s had asked the CIA not to let this become public because the government did not want their citizens to know that we had a listening station on on Australian soil. So there's a record that was in the collection that had information about Oswald. Nothing in the information about Oswald in Japan, we already knew. There's nothing in there we didn't already know. The mere fact that it was from Australia. Now, <laughs> while this is being postponed, there is a TV show in Australia, the number one show in Australia, about what our listening station on Australia. <laughs> Time gap. Right. Uh, yeah, and I, I want to also correct. Um, so part of the tr President Trump mythology is that he sourced something and had a, had no choice but to postpone it. What, for, what I've learned from my lawsuit with the, under the Freedom of Information Act was that the postponement was well into effect. Trump did not know that his NSC was going through drafts of documents with the CIA and the FBI and the National Archives to, to postpone the records. So while he may have said publicly, I'm gonna release the records, he had no idea that his national security apparatus was already in the process of drafting, going through several drafts. So both, both times he didn't know that the decision was made for him already. So and just to, to amplify a little bit, but one argument is, well, all, everything that they're hiding is trivial because a lot of it is, and that is true. On the other hand, if you've been looking at the fact pattern of the case since the 1990s, since we've you know kind of gotten the whole record for the first time, you know you can see big gaps in the record, and the, the and these are quite significant. And if and when we have declassification in these areas, it's much more problematic for the CIA. So what I think is going on is you keep, you know, we're looking for a needle in a haystack. And so it's in the CIA's interest to keep the haystack very big. Yeah. That makes it hard to find the needle. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they, if they declassify everything and probably 90% of it is probably trivial, you know, then we're going to start, we're going to get down to brass tacks and see, you know, what's most sensitive to them. And that's also the point of the lawsuit is there's ridiculous overclassification of trivial information. The statute has not been followed. And there's highly significant information, which is not national security related, but is merely embarrassing to the reputation of the CIA. So we're looking for enforcement of the law to get to the bottom of the barrel. And, you know, it's a it's an arduous process because they are digging their heels in. And what we see with both Trump and Biden is the CIA's ability to roll the president. I mean, I don't yeah. want to put it in too <laughs> negative a, con you know, a context, but yeah. you know, it happened to two presidents of diametrically opposite ideological points of view. And at the end of the day, they need the CIA more than the CIA needs them. And the president you know, Biden's fighting a war in Ukraine. He wants the CIA on his side. He doesn't yeah. want to piss them off on something that really makes them mad. So, so at the end of the day, he gives them what they wanted. I don't know why Trump did what he did. I don't know what Trump saw. His, his word is not very reliable. You know, maybe he didn't see anything. Maybe he did. You know, we just don't know. But in any case, you know, he got rolled. He had a chance to enforce the law and he didn't do it for whatever reason. So, you know, I attribute it to the entrenched power of the CIA and the constellation of things. For a president, they're a very important tool, and the president can't alienate that instrument of his power.
So and they can keep JFK secrets. Yeah. It, it, there's a couple of things that are important as well. Um, first of all, when the review board went out of business, their work was not done. They, they had a four-year authorization from Congress, but when they went out of business, they were still outstanding record searches. Um, in other words, they had still um, had requests for additional assassination records that um, had not been, that the, those search results were not completed by the time the ARB went out of business, the review board. Um, so there are actually records that are not in the collection that we are still seeking. So even if they release every last record in the collection, there are still records, according to the ARB, that are not out there. And then there are records that the ARB did not get to see um, because the way the statute worked was the agencies had 300 days, allegedly, well, at least that was the intent. <laughs> scour, there, were, there were records about the assassination distributed throughout the federal government. I mean, there were, because every, the Department of State, the Immigration and National Nation Service, the IRS, all these agencies had, had been mobilized to see if, the, uh, to get information on Oswald. Not on the people, but nevertheless. Um, and the national in this Department of State was also monitoring a lot of what was going on in Europe. People don't people who weren't born then don't understand that um, the Warren Commission was as much about um, assuaging our allies as it was giving the American people uh, a, a, a reassuring answer, because the Europeans were convinced that the, the President Kennedy was killed by a right wing conspiracy, and this is at the height of the Cold War. And yeah. the Cold War was beginning to 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 getting warm. I mean, not warm. I guess it was beginning to, to the the tensions were beginning to be reduced by the efforts of President Kennedy and and Nikita Khrushchev. And there was a concern that oops, we're going back towards. And this is only a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so there are so there are the, the ARB was tasked with asking all the agencies to search for their records give them to the ARB, and the ARB had two, two jobs. One was to determine if, if the records were assassination records, as they defined, and then two, if the records were assassination records, to decide whether or not they could be declassified at that moment. The vast amount of them were declassified, but there was a bunch of records that were not. Embarrassment is not one of the grounds under the statute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Biden... This was unanimously passed by Congress. President Biden voted for the law. So, and the other senator problem from that, Delaware, right? And the other problem is that this is not. You have to. The, the the assassination is sixty years old now, and we just had a memo last week, which Jeff could talk about. If you don't give pe the names of the people, researchers can't interview them. And we are losing people at an increasingly rate. People are yeah. dying. They're now in their 90s or 80s. Yeah. If you don't, if we don't know who they are, we can't interview them. And just last this last record dump, there was a very important memo that had been released, you know, several times ago. I think in 2017 and maybe earlier. But the name of the author was unknown. And we just learned that author, name of that author. He died last year. Uh. They've been released in 2017. He his and Jeff could talk about this. His mission was he was writing about the effort of the, the Miami station of the CIA to investigate whether any Cuban exiles were involved in the assassination. And the man, we, we never got a chance to interview him. We didn't know who he was. And then we just learned out that he's dead. And this is part of the waiting <laughs> game playing. The FBI wow. is holding back records until the people in, in their records are dead. Yeah, so, and let me uh, let me just explain about about that memo, Bill, because th th this is a is, it's a classic example of a couple of things. Okay, I mean, one, how classification controls the story. This was a memo written by a, an undercover officer in the Miami station named Donald Heath. He was a foreign intelligence officer in the Miami station, and in 1977, when the JFK Review Board, when the House Select Committee on Assassinations got going. He wrote a memo to them and he said, you know, you should know what we did at the time because we tried to investigate. Heath is trying to help the investigation with his memo by telling what he did. And the story he told was quite extraordinary, which was the week after the assassination, 
after Oswald had been killed, after President Johnson and J. Edgar Hoover had both decided that they needed to assure the public that Oswald had acted alone, that same week, the CIA was mounting an intensive investigation of its own assets in South Florida, asking, had, had anybody in the president's enemies in South Florida been involved in the assassination? So you have the public stance of the government, unanimous, one man alone did it, don't worry about anything. And privately, the CIA is pursuing a very different agenda. We didn't learn Donald Heath's name until last, until December of this year. Wow. And when we saw that, we that tells us something very important about the assassination. And you will hear mainstream media people say there's nothing new in, in this. No, the, the Donald Heath memo is new and it's very important because it tells you where the CIA went, public statements notwithstanding, where the CIA thought that the assassination had emanated from. Second thing, there's no sign that the results of the investigation that Heath participated in and described were ever shared with the Warren Commission or any other investigation. Go we favor. don't know what happened, but we do know from Heath's memo, it was a systemic effort. He said every officer in the station was expected to question their assets and come back with answers. You know, you don't go to that kind of effort to collect all of that information if you don't reach some conclusions that are passed on to your superiors. That's what a central intelligence agency does. And yet we never saw the results of that investigation. In so fact, that puts the existence of records that are not in the collection and that contradict the official finding. And so when you, you know, when, when, when we say, you know, what are they hiding? They're hiding this story, which is embarrassing to them. It has nothing to do with national security. It has to do with embarrassment of the CIA. And, and, the, and the, re, the memo refers to situation reports that were, would be issued monthly about this multi-month multi, multi investigation. Um, and the author, Heath, says he saw these records in this guy's office in 1973. They are nowhere to be seen now. Similarly, mm -hmm. another, another connection to, to current times is the Secret Service, after the JFK Act was passed, every agency has a responsibility of searching for the records, not destroying them, preserving them, and then transmitting them to the R for transmission to the National Archives. The Secret Service destroys records in 95 about yeah. trips that the president, the security trips, um, security reports about trips the president took in the fall of 63. He died, he was killed in November. Um, the Secret Service, no one ever got punished for doing that. So it's not surprising then, then when January 6th rolls around, the Secret Service destroys their emails, <laughs> right? So th th there are lessons being learned. The government people are learning that, A, they don't have to comply with the law, and B, that if they destroy, if they, if they don't, for the most part, they're not going to be punished. The other interesting thing for your, law your, your the lawyers on this call is the Heath memo does not have a typical, as for, as a lawyer, when you look at the memo, there's not an introduction saying, you asked me to do this following, you know, the introduction, it is, it's like he was asked verbally to do something and he writes this memo and you can, and it was written in March of 77, which is a, uh, an interesting time for the House Select Assassinations Committee, because that's the time when there was all this funding problems and then the original uh, director of the committee, uh, Sprague, and then Tannenbaum leave the committee and replaced by Blakely. And that's when the, the committee started going off, off the, the trail. Um, this was written right around that time. So it's like, it seems like he had told Tannenbaum or Sprague, he had information. They asked him to write a memo. There's no introduction. He goes right into it. And then, Jeff, there's a later memo that's much shorter and less informative that's written under the different administration, right, of, of like in December? Uh, it, it's, it, it's written a year and a half later, um, and it's in response to questions from the House Select Committee. And it focuses on the Miami station's efforts to investigate the culpability of the Cuban government not of Cuban exiles. So it's really, it's it's kind of off the point. Um, and it doesn't have all the details that the first memo had. Not coincidentally, that memo 
Keith's name was released on that memo four years ago. So that was the less sensitive information. It was this one that, that detailed how they investigated the exiles for JFK's assassination that was the most sensitive. And this points out something that, that we can now see, a fact pattern that we now see, which is to this day, and from day one, the most sensitive material government records were government records that related to Lee Harvey Oswald and his Cuban contacts, not his Russian contacts, his Cuban contacts. And that's still where we see the veil of secrecy come down. That's still where we see, because if we lift the veil of secrecy, we will see CIA, inf CIA knowledge of Oswald before the assassination. And that information by its very nature is embarrassing to the CIA. That's what they're hiding through this very concerted effort. And, you know, and I think at this point, you know, they know that's what they're hiding. And yeah. one of the interesting <laughs> things that 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 happened last year was when I came out and presented some of the evidence about records related to the assassination, related to George Joannidis, an officer who participated in the investigation that was described by, by Donald Keith, the CIA issued some talking points to reporters and they sort of said, semi off the record, you know, pay no attention to what Morley's saying. But they, they didn't <laughs> contradict what I said, which was what they're hiding is a pre-assassination interest in Oswald. What the CIA told its favorite reporters in these talking points, which one reporter gave to me, was um, the CIA never engaged Oswald before the assassination. Now, that is a... A, a marked revision from what the CIA told the Warren Commission, which was, we knew nothing about this guy and he came yes. out of nowhere. Now, now they're not saying that anymore. Now they're just saying, we knew all about him, but rest assured, we never engaged him. So they know that they have a problem. They are starting to back up and adjust their story in to respond to what we're saying. Because when we went into court and, and filed this case, we got very positive coverage, you know, which is unusual for the JFK research community. Wow. Because all of a sudden, thanks to the legal work that had been done and thanks to the continued stonewalling of the agencies, we had the more credible story. You know, the story of yeah. the mainstream media, <laughs> oh, the Warren Commission got it right, pay, pay no attention. Yeah. I mean, the story's never been particularly credible to the public. Now it's not even credible to the mainstream media. And so we got very positive coverage because we're saying, what is going on here? We know? have a very detailed. That's, the, that's what the lawsuit has done is we have reframed the issue around this is about accountability and why would they be resisting accountability? That, you know, that doesn't make sense. So we need to apply the law here. We have a very detailed complaint, more detailed than normal. Um, we made a conscious decision to tell the story, even though we were probably telling our our the Department of Justice more than they really were entitled to know, but we decided to do this. Um, I want to drill down again for your listeners how the story of we never knew about Oswald came out. Um, so picture this: we have the Warren Commission that is deposing um, the head of the CIA, John McCone, um, and his assistant Bill Helms. And they're asking uh, them questions about what the CIA knew about Oswald when he was in Russia. The person who's asking them the questions is Alan Dulles, who is the former CIA director <laughs> during the time that Oswald was in Russia. So in other words, the man who's asking the questions knows the answers. And he's <laughs> asking leading questions, basically, um, hinting or directing them to say and it was he's like well you wouldn't have known I mean, that was the state department's job right to tell you about that <laughs> and and that's how that's just one example of how the warren commission manufactured a record the black the black witnesses to the assassination were the only ones that were asked again by alan dulles and jerry ford Do, have you ever been in trouble with law enforcement now, in 1964, in Texas, um, that was a clear message 
yeah. that there was a story that they had to tell. And if they didn't tell, they could potentially be in trouble. But there are, um, the Warren Commission never took the, the, the initial interviews of the witnesses were not recorded. Um, uh, and then when they went to interview the Parkland doctors, before the Parkland doctors uh, testified, they were given a copy of the autopsy report. Uh, they asked them to take a look at it. Now, what happens? You've seen the president for 20 minutes trying to rescue his, his life. You think you have seen the injuries. Now you see this autopsy report, which is inconsistent with what you remember to be the, the injuries. The, the logical conclusion as a doctor is going to say, well, I guess maybe I got it wrong. Now, some doctors were very insistent on what they saw, but these are little, little ways. These are really smart people. Arlen, Arlen Specter, after one of the depositions of Dr. Jones, when they went off the record, they're finished. Um, he said, we got, we, we, we have some witnesses that say they believe they saw, they heard shots from the grassy knob, but we don't believe they're persuasive and they're wrong. But that was after the deposition. <laughs> But yeah. these are the ways that the record, the star, historical record was manufactured. There's many ways to do it. But um, yeah, and let me just point out the big picture there because it's relevant to the JFK records act. So that's what Dick Helms and, 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 and John McClone tell Alan Dulles under these leading questions. We didn't really know much about this guy. We, our information was minimal. We didn't get anything from other agencies. Which, come on. There was no basis for questioning. <laughs> yeah. There was no basis for questioning that belief until the 1990s, when, thanks to the JFK Records Act, we began to get the declassification of the documents that the CIA held in its Oswald file before November 22nd, 1963. And when we got them all, and it wasn't fully declassified until 2001, when the last name came off. Um, we saw the information wasn't minimal. It was maximal. There were 40 yeah. documents in there from four different agencies, including the CIA itself. They knew about his arrest. They knew about his foreign contacts. They knew about his personal life. They were reading his mail. They were paying attention to him every step of the way as he made his way to Dallas. That's what we understood from incredible. The, you know, the, the, the declassification of the Oswald file. And people say, well, you know, there's nothing new in here. You know, no, there's something new that we've learned since the 1990s is the pre-assassination Oswald file is a major finding. The mainstream media has never looked at it because only conspiracy theorists are interested in stuff like that. But if you look at it from a detached point of view, like a historian of the CIA, that's always how I tried to approach it. It's a startling document because yeah. It's complete nonsense that we had no idea who this guy was. No, the top CIA officers in the country, in the agency, responsible for counterintelligence, were the people who knew the most about this guy. That opens up the possibility that they were running an operation involving him. And so when we now see that there are records from these people that are still kept secret, you know, suspicion is the obvious result why would you be hiding that if there wasn't something to hide you know if you feel that there was something to hide so thanks to the jfk records act we do know that there are significant jfk records that are outstanding that the cia knows about these records and is consciously hiding them to spare themselves embarrassment and, and uh bill there's another thing about mexico city that um judge tunheim john tunheim who uh, was the chair of the committee um the review, review board is a district judge court, a di district court judge in Minnesota. He just came off his uh, his round of being the senior, uh, the chair, the, the senior judge in the um, in the district. Um, he uh, told us that um, the review board was trying to get information from the Mexican government, um, and the State Department was not was almost based, was not only not helping, they were kind of interfering with the process. There was a document that was recently released in full. Um, and the reason it had been redacted was it revealed that we had had um, an agreement with the president of Mexico on wiretapping of the Cuban embassy. 
um, during the, um, when Oswald was in Mexico City. The quid pro quo for that arrangement was that the Mexican government was to get all of our tapes, copies of all our tapes. Now there is a dispute as to whether Lee Oswald was actually recorded um, when he was making calls from the embassy to the Russian embassy. Um, our transcribers, and Jeff knows much more about this than I do, and he can fill in the blanks. Our transcriber said the person spoke poor Russian, and everybody that has been on the record said the Russian, that Oswald spoke very good Russian. This means that the Mexican government possibly has the tapes. Now, whether they're still there, <laughs> I mean, they certainly could have been there in the 90s, uh, whether they're still there and whether they're in good condition that they could be listened to, um, you know, we don't know, but this is this information just came out. So, um, and Jeff has lots to talk about about Mexico City. Well, I, I want to stop yeah. here and, and I want to take a transition because we're going to do uh, this going to be a two part podcast. So let's stop there. We're going to take a break and then we're going to come back uh, with uh, part two um, covering the Jeff K Records Act, Lee Harvey Oswald, and the assassination of Jeff K.